give a shot at talking about inventing. And uh, of course the topic, how to have fun at a company, because I had fun uh, and I still do have fun because that's very important to me and it should be to you and invent things and, and do this on a schedule, which is kind of different than a lot of people. People, a lot of people think that inventions just kind of like show up, uh, but you can actually plan them. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And then I'll, I'll give you an idea of the thermal inkjet story because that's part of a way to cover this. So now I'm gonna find out if my buttons on my keyboard actually do what they're supposed to. So let's see. Nope, they don't. Okay, so we'll try this. I'm trying to go to the next slide there. Okay, we got the next slide. Is it working? No. It worked for me. Yeah, it was a little slow, but yeah, it works. It works slowly. Okay, well, that's an opportunity for an invention, folks. Anyhow, the plan today is first we'll talk a little bit about inventing, and then I will uh, give you an idea how thermal inkjet works, and some of you may or may not know how it works, and uh, some of the challenges about that, and that'll uh, and then after that, we'll hit some future technology stuff. First of all, uh, it almost goes without saying that each of you are quite creative. Otherwise, you would not be here in this meeting. That's kind of one point. And this is in spite of what maybe you've heard from other people. Some people may think that you're like really lazy. And in fact, uh, uh, sometimes it's important to be lazy if you want to invent things uh, because then you find ways to do things that don't require as much effort from you. So that's inventing. So I don't mind being lazy. In fact, uh, uh, you've all probably invented something already. Just think about it. Uh, I don't know if you can even remember what the first thing you invented is. It may not be like earth shattering, but it's something. Uh, maybe it's a way to make it so you can have warm beverage all the time. Uh, maybe it's something else. I'm also going to be drinking a little bit while we're here, but it's all non-alcoholic, so don't worry. I'll stay relatively constant in my insanity for the entire period of time. Okay. So I'm going to give you a few cool tools. And in fact, uh, at the end of the presentation, and we probably won't cover that, but you can see it in the slides if you want to look later, is a way to foster creative ideas um, that's really worked for me and for a lot of people I've worked with. So, and I can of course interact with you on that later. So we'll we'll talk a little bit about hopefully what's on the top of the slides. So you've probably heard or seen necessity is the mother of invention. And this is attributed to Plato way back in the, what is it, Greek times, right? Okay, do you believe that? Come on, okay. Actually, quite often inventions are not because of a necessity. You know, do you really think that, for example, cars were a necessity? They weren't. If we didn't have cars, we wouldn't know that we need them, okay? so. A necessity to me is something that you absolutely positively have to have to exist. And most of the things we have are not in that category. On the other hand, they're incredibly desirable. You know, like, I don't know how many people suddenly had to have a cellular telephone when they were first invented, but it was a whole lot. And the difference uh, I will express between telephone and cellular telephone I think you guys know better than I do, but I will start off with Alexander Graham Bell. And uh, this uh, inventor came up and demonstrated the telephone and then sold them. But a telephone then had a crank on the side and that crank made a, a ringer on every telephone on that line make noise to tell you that somebody was calling. Okay, we actually had uh, I actually had uh, some of my relatives had crank telephones uh, because uh, they were uh, in back areas of the United States that never moved to the 20th century, uh, much less the 21st century. 
But uh, uh, in fact, one of them, uh, we had a neighbor that uh, would pick up the phone every time it cranked and she knew what everybody was doing everywhere because of course she listened to every conversation. Um, and then there's, and the way you choose who you were going to call was a function of how many times you turned the crank. So if you got ring, 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 that would be one person and other sequences would be somebody else. Since that time, we've moved through things. The first portable wireless telephones, if you wish, were called bag phones. They were pretty big. They weighed about, about uh, 25 kilograms and they, uh, you carried the bag. And if you can imagine carrying 25 kilograms, that's a pretty heavy load. Um, and it had a battery and a bunch of stuff in it and you could make telephone calls and nothing else. You could not do anything else. Well, now we are with these flat phones. I'm gonna move through flip phones and flat phones and flat phones are really not just a telephone, are they? There are a whole lot of things. And every time there's an improvement, this is an incremental improvement on an existing device, the telephone. Now we have something that communicates in many, many different ways. And in fact, uh, sometimes can be rather annoying, okay? Uh, because of all the things it can do. At this point, you should be able to think about what you might see next in this area. So you know what is annoying about current flat phones. They're too big for your pockets, right? Anybody got a pocket big enough for your phone? Well, so the problem is they're just flat out going out of what you need. You need something that's a bit more convenient and I'll bet you that somebody's gonna come up with much better solutions to the problem. And then those are gonna become like must desires and needs that people will just have to have. I can't wait to find a item that I use as a piece of apparel that would actually allow me not to carry this big flat disc in my pocket all the time. So I'm looking forward to that. And we're pretty close because you know you have Bluetooth headphones so you can stick your per, your your uh, phone in your purse or something, but things are changing. Okay. Well, so the first rule or the zeroth rule of invention is to dream. You should dream up things that you'd like to see. And I always start that off by thinking about, I wish I could. I use that phrase and then I go on and this works in small groups too. So if you get some of your friends together, you can have a, an I wish I could party and come up with ideas of things that ought to be invented. Okay. I got to move on a little bit because I'm slow. Okay, so here's, here's an example of inventing. Um, I wish I could grow my own fuel, okay. And this is a picture of some students many years ago. Uh, to give you an idea, I took this picture with a camera that had film. Okay, <laughs> how long ago was that? So anyhow, uh, so they uh, were looking at ways, they, these were actually some chemical engineering students and they had learned about biodiesel. So they started encouraging people to try this. But back when they were doing this, Actually, in the United States, even through 2006, which is a while ago, but not a long time ago, if you put biodiesel in your car, the warranty would be voided. And that's a, so that's the first rule of inventing is ignore what I call imposed reality. Okay, some people do things, they, 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 they require something like you can't put biofuel in your car. Uh, and they're doing this because they have already figured out how they're going to have their company stay in business and it doesn't involve whatever you're coming up with. Okay, I'm using biofuel as an example here, but there's plenty of others, okay? For example, Uber, and there's much, of other, much other things like that where a different concept has come up for something and uh, there have been imposed realities to uh, avoid that actually uh, coming forth. But you can get around them with time and that's fine. And finally in 2006, even 
the large company Daimler Chrysler, uh, they became the first company in the United States to allow biofuels without voiding warranties in cars. And then uh, people would start doing it. Now, crazy people like me and many of you, I bought a pickup before 2006, a diesel pickup, and I filled it with biodiesel because I knew that it would not ruin the car. And in fact, it was fantastic because I actually got better mileage than people that were running regular diesel, which is interesting. Okay, let's move on. The second rule of inventing is do not, do not ignore physics, okay? So you come up with an idea, I wish I could fly, okay? Well, uh, that might involve magic unless you think of some other way to do it than just standing outside and levitating. So uh, reality is adequately entertaining. People can fly, okay? Uh, but they don't do it just by going outside and thinking that they're going to fly. And, you know, and uh, some other people fly, but they do it by taking pills. I'm not recommending that mechanism. Okay, these guys look pretty crazy over here. Uh, they had just got done, they had just finished uh, building their first biodiesel facility in the basement of the, uh, the chemical engineering building. And about three days later, the fire marshal uh, told us we had to do a few things, but they had fun and everything was totally safe, but uh, it was different. So we had to go through a few uh, solutions to that. Okay, and the final rule in inventing, pretty simple, is after you have come up with an idea, try it out, okay? And don't, don't feel that you have to make it exactly like what you come up with. Um, for example, and I'll talk about HP's inkjet on this a little bit, um, you should try to take existing things and put them into operation to make what you want to invent, okay? And it won't work quite as well as what you could with what you really want, but it'll be close enough for you to demonstrate operation. At that point, you can then probably get somebody to help you with the money you need to do it right, okay? So it's okay to demonstrate before with stuff that isn't quite right and then prove that you have something that's going to work. So uh, I ought to tell you a little bit about thermal inkjet at this point because it occupied a fair amount of my time and I think you'll have fun with it. Uh, thermal inkjet is the technology that's used in practically every inkjet printer that you see. There are a couple of other technologies, but I'm gonna focus on thermal inkjet in this discussion just to give you a flavor for how it works. And by the way, if I get long-winded and it's time to quit, just let me know. Uh, and I, I'm also willing, if you guys feel like asking a question, uh, just uh, notice, note that. And then I think the moderator in here will be kind enough to tell me that somebody's asking for a question. I don't have to have them all at the end of the talk. Okay. So before how inkjet works, uh, there's a couple of questions. Uh, one of them is, why do we print stuff? Okay, kind of a rhetorical question. And of course, what was printing before thermal inkjet? Well, that one you kind of know, and I'll go into that a little bit. After that, I'm gonna talk about the invention of thermal inkjet, which uh, became a very lucrative product line for Hewlett Packard and a couple of other companies, including Canon and Ibsen. Um, and how we that were inventing it knew it was gonna work from the beginning and the very simple physics in it. And then I'm also gonna point out how we were able to get a big company like Hewlett Packard throw some money at this to get it to continue. Cause it wasn't uh, just walking in and saying, hey, I'd like to have $20 million to work on this. Uh, that doesn't happen. Okay. so. Why do we print stuff? Well, printing has been going on for quite some time. I think the first printing may have been the Babylonian tablets and they did it in uh, much of theirs was uh, accounting. 
they wanted when they had a market, they wanted to sell something to somebody and then they wanted to make sure that that person uh, paid for it and got a receipt for what they were buying. And then uh, they also had a means to ensure that it was uh, that somebody didn't cheat. And this is pretty clever with the Babylonians. Uh, they're using clay tablets. Okay. And what they would do is they would actually make a clay tablet with a clay tablet inside of it. And then when they made the impressions on, they'd make up the impressions on a piece of clay and they'd slip it inside a clay tablet. And then they'd make up the same impressions on the outside. Then they'd seal it. Okay, so then the receipt is the outer one. Okay, if there's any contention, then you just break it open and look inside and you've got the original receipt uh, untouched by human hand. Very clever way to ensure that you have a valid copy because people could modify the external receipt, but they couldn't change the internal receipt without breaking the external receipt. Okay, now a lot of stuff goes on to electronic documentation these days, uh, but I'm going to ask uh, how long does an electronic document stay constant? Uh, what do you think? Do cloud stored legal documents stay unchanged? You ever get the feeling that when you get one of these notices from a company that says uh, our terms have changed, you know, and then you go to a link, it's different. Okay. How do you know that the next time you access that same link, you're not going to read a different document yet? You know, uh, well, it's not trivial for the normal human being. Now, some of us here know how to track documents, even when they're electronic, but most people don't. And they just take it on faith that people are being honest when they have external electronic documents uh, in the cloud. Now, before the cloud, there were lots of other technologies. I just listed a few here that you may or may not know about, um, like reel-to-reel -reel magnetic tape. Uh, that was something that I used back in 1969 uh, when I was in high school, because I would record the top 100 hits from the rock station, and then I'd sell it to my friends <laughs> for a cost, because of course there's copyrights on these things. You can't just run off and make copies for nothing. But um, it was kind of fun. Uh, but then as you move on, there are other magnetic media that were used over the years. Uh, I don't know how many of you have ever seen a cassette tape uh, player. Uh, okay, and then there's VHS, that's a videotapes. Then there were floppy disks that used to be used to store computer stuff. They went from five and a quarter inch uh, diameter to three and a half inch diameter. And in fact, at Science Camp, we started off with uh, computers that actually did not even have floppy disks. They had uh, paper tape and a magnetic, uh, magnetized drum that stored the data. Um, and then there's CDs and DVDs. And now I think a lot of people use just a USB stick to store pretty much everything. And a lot of computers don't even have a spot that you can read a DVD. So it's all changed. What that means is the permanent record, if you wanted to read for example, a five and a quarter inch floppy disk today, could you? Well, maybe it would be not easy to do that. On the other hand, you can still read a piece of paper printed. So all of these technologies accept the printed word on a flat piece of media that you can actually grab a hold of and look at. Uh, all of these have the problem that you need some kind of device in order to interpret what it's saying. So they're not quite as permanent as printed stuff. Okay, printing before thermal ink jet. Okay, it started off 100,000 years ago and zip, we're now at 40 years ago is when thermal ink jet started. So that's there's other technologies since that, but I won't talk about them in this uh, conversation too much. And you can look at this later if you want. I'm not going to go into too much detail here, except to point out that the printing press itself was maybe 500 years ago, 
And on the scale of 100,000 years to 500 years, that's uh, not much of that entire period. So you can see stuff's been printed for a long, long time. And I believe it's gonna continue to be printed. So now, inkjet, thermal inkjet, and this is how we knew when we were starting the research that we could invent it, invent something called thermal inkjet. First of all, I'd say it's an evolutionary invention. It's not revolutionary. It's revolutionary in the market because it made a big difference in the market, but it was an evolutionary invention. Uh, there was inkjet printing a long time ago, and I'm gonna show you an example of one using compressed air. After that, there were piezoelectric pumps and there was fluid streaming where the fluid would be deflected. And then you could print things just by turning on and off a fluid stream. Okay, so inkjet was around. Uh, the invention called the coffee pot, uh, the percolator. I don't know how many of you know what a percolator is, so I've got something on that too. But a percolator demonstrates a method of ejecting fluids that's very interesting. And that was part of the invention of the inkjet, the thermal inkjet. And then we took those ideas and we combined them with something that was already being manufactured called thermal printers. I'll describe what they are in just a bit, but it's basically a very, very tiny heater. Uh, and those three things, along with something photolithography, which is the method that's used to make integrated circuits, uh, those put together made thermal inkjet. So the first inkjet printing was in the 1890s. Most people think it was a bit uh, uh, more recent. And the method was to use compressed air to spit ink out of nozzles. And the objective was to form patterns on carpets. Okay. And the reason they did this is because it was a lot easier than making a screen for every carpet and a lot less expensive, it turns out. And therefore, the company that came up with this started selling carpets for banks because every bank wanted to have special carpets with their name on it. And these guys could sell them for one fifth the price of the normal ones. So they made a lot of money that way. And they developed this technology called inkjet. They were pretty much fully mechanical using pneumatic valves and cog wheels. And you program them by cutting a new cog wheel or a disc. Here's the patent, US patent 587934, which was issued in 1897, and that's for an inkjet. Okay, and it looks a lot different than inkjets of today. It's got this cog wheel, that's where those spokes are. And in there, there is the information on when each droplet's gonna spit out of the nozzles and onto the fabric that's going past. That's how it works. And this is the coffee percolator. Some of you may know what a coffee percolator is and most of you probably don't, but basically all it's doing is, I think, I don't know whether my cursor is visible for you guys. I'm putting it there. Uh, there's this F at the we bottom. We can see your cursor, yeah. You guys can see it? Okay, great. Right here, see this region F? That's a little space and water is in that space. This percolator is full of water and then you put it on a heater and this area here boils. In boiling, some of the water goes from liquid to gas and that gaseous water then causes the fluid to come up this tube and into this pot up here. So you're not really boiling all the water, you're just boiling some of the water and the rest of it pops up into this bas basket. So then the percolator spits hot water up into the, this basket and in the case of coffee, then it, the hot water filters through the coffee and comes back down here and it just keeps recirculating until you have a freshly brewed pot of coffee. Of course, nowadays everybody uses high pressure steam systems uh, for the most part, they don't use percolators. Anyhow, this one was invented in 1889. So it's as old as the inkjet, you see that? It's a, uh, and it's some 
Illinois farmer patented this model. There were other percolators throughout the world, uh, but this is the first one that just used a hot surface like a wood stove. So we know inkjet with compressed air works, and we know that water boils. And we also, in the case of Hewlett Packard, knew that thermal printers exist. And then we had to take these three things and put them together to make this new technology called inkjet, thermal inkjet. And the physics of thermal inkjet are pretty simple. Heat is transferred to a volatile liquid like water, causes a phase change to form a gas under high pressure, and that's used to spit out or expel a portion of the fluid through a nozzle. You turn off the heat, and then the gas reverts back to a liquid. And that reduces the pressure in that region because you've already expelled some fluid. And then the chamber now refills. And the reason it refills is one other bit of physics, uh, surface free energy. If you have a capillary, you know that water will draw up a capillary and it does it because of its surface tension or its surface free energy. So the chamber was designed so that it would refill from the surface free energy drawing material back into the reservoir. Okay, so that's kind of the physics. And then I'm gonna show, this is where the thermal printing technology came from. It's this thing here is printing characters with thermal. It's doing that because there's a piece of paper here that uh, I didn't do that on purpose. I'm gonna go back a couple. I'm beginning to learn how to use my computer. Bear with me. Anyhow, the, the uh, thermal paper is treated with a chemical that changes from clear to colored after heat. Uh, and by the way, this little thing behind it was the first desktop computer. It had a whopping 16 kilobytes of program storage and it used a cassette tape for memory storage. That's back in about 1979. Okay, so how thermal printing works is right here. You take a die, you put it in a layer on a piece of paper, and then you pass a very tiny heater across the surface and heat those portions of the die that you want to have change color. You scan it back and forth across the paper and you get text or whatever else you want, a graph if you like works very well. And that dye, I think, was first synthesized about 1920 by a little tiny company in Germany. Uh, I think uh, that that's kind of how it came into being. Now, thermal inkjet, if you were to go to your printer and take one of the print cartridges out and then put it under a microscope, you'd see something like this. There's a little reservoir. It has a resistor on the bottom of it. That's that thermal uh, printer resistor. And then there's this little reservoir. And on top of this is placed a nozzle. So fluid fills this reservoir. The resistor heats up. It forms a gas bubble. Heats up forms a glass bubble in about three microseconds. The bubble grows in three to 10 microseconds, and that causes the rest of the fluid to expel itself from the chamber. If you do it just right, this little air coming in from the outside does not get into the chamber, and instead, the whole thing cools off fast enough to allow it to then refill with fluid from the reservoir because of the surface tension. So the expulsion of the drop takes about 10 to 20 microseconds, and then it takes about 80 microseconds to refill the chamber in this case. So that's how it works. And the only thing that's moving in this entire system is the ink. Okay, so 
Uh, the job for my group and me was to develop the ink to go out of these little things. Uh, first, a lot of people say, well, you know, what could be easier? Ink's got to be simple. Yeah. Well, of course, ink and a ballpoint pen is pretty simple. It works pretty well. And ink and a fountain pen, uh, uh, they're pretty simple. But this ink here has a few constraints that are a bit more difficult than just uh, fountain pen ink. Oh, by the way, here's a picture of a droplet coming out. It's firing out of a 50 micron hole, and it's going at seven meters per second. So you know it can go quite a distance in just a short period of time. And in fact, this, there's always a space between the nozzle plate and the paper. I think in most printers, it's around two millimeters. So that means that you don't get a lot of dirt on the nozzle plate because of the fact that you leave a little space. And you can do it with inkjet because these droplets are nicely formed. Yeah but they're nicely formed because the ink is very special. This velocity of seven meters per second means that this thing is under a lot of stress. This is a drop. After it leaves the nozzle, it's gonna become a round drop as it's flying towards the paper. And when it gets to the paper, if everything's done right, it'll land as a spherical drop, okay? Uh, quite a bit of energy is stuffed into each one of these drops. Well, it says 2.5 nanojoules per drop. That's not much. But if you calculate it in joules per kilogram, it's 50, 50 joules per kilogram. So some of you can think about that and you can realize that if you put 50 joules to a kilogram of water, what happens? Well, quite a lot. Okay. So now we had to find a way to get this crazy idea funded because we demonstrated that it could work, but now we had to figure out how to get a bunch of non-engineers and scientists excited about it and realize that it'd be useful. Uh, the uh, downside is that we were in a company that was already making printers. They were making a lot of printers and they were all laser printers and they were selling a lot of laser printers. Um, uh, but they were rather expensive. So we had to convince them that this was worth going. So the first time when we needed a small amount of money, we got the upper management of the company together. And this is where we had a little bit of fun because we would take a business card from one of them and we'd hold it in a little holder and they'd watch printing form on that card without seeing anything. Because of course the droplets are too small to see and they would spray onto the paper and suddenly they'd have text. Now, it didn't, it, hurt, it didn't hurt at all because what we'd do is we'd take a business card from like a manager, you know, John Smith, the general manager of uh, Hewlett Packard's XYZ division. And then we'd print him a new card and it would say, John Smith, executive vice president of Hewlett Packard. And we say, oh, oh, you aren't already that? Well, maybe you will become one. And of course, that was kind of fun and they enjoyed that and we had a lot of fun with it. So that was the first uh, process. And after those demonstrations of just black and white printing on very special material, um, the upper management felt, well, it's probably worth going ahead for a little bit longer. Okay, uh, the second round of funding, uh, we needed more money because you know you always need more money when you're doing stuff because you find all kinds of things to do. and uh, we had, we were almost at the point where we were able to get out a product, uh, but we still needed to refund it. And that's a tough decision point because it's usually a lot more money at that point because you've got lots of stuff going on. Uh, so we decided we'd print color stock certificates. So we did that. We printed up some stock certificates that looked just like the real ones, okay? Which is an interesting phenomenon. Turns out with thermal inkjet printing, you could print documents that would look just like the real ones, like a real $20 bill at that time. And uh, after this demonstration in which we did get funding, uh, the next week we got a call from the US Treasury Department. Uh, they wanted to learn a little bit about inkjet and what they could do about it because they could see a potential problem showing up. Uh, so that was entertaining too, and a lot of fun. It was fun going into the Treasury and talking to people about this and and letting them realize that uh, US money needs help. Um, now, it still needs help. We got some of it done, but 
Those of you that aren't from the United States uh, realize that US money has one obvious flaw, uh, paper currency. And you know, I could ask you what it is. Uh, we're in this giant session and I'll just leave it at that, but I'll be able to respond later unless somebody already knows what I'm talking about. You're welcome to respond if you like. What's the most obvious thing that's that's wrong with US currency today, the paper currency? Ideas? Okay. It's not okay. backed by the gold standard, sir. We went off the gold standard years ago. The US currency system runs purely on credit and credit alone. Well, that's okay, but I'll tell you what the big, I think that's a, a problem, but I'm gonna just respond with what I believe to be the most obvious defect in US currency. Bigger bills are the same size as smaller bills. So if you have a thousand dollar bill, it's exactly the same dimension as a $1 bill. And a clever person can take a $1 bill, completely remove everything on it and replace it with, with what you see on a $1,000 bill, okay? And for some people, they would take it. They wouldn't check to see if the hologram is correct, which it probably would be. And they wouldn't check for the magnetic stripe because it might not have the magnetic reader. Okay, so they could actually pass a fake $1,000 bill today, and it does happen. So that's interesting in itself. Uh, usually it's not hundred uh, thousands, it's usually $100 bills that go that way uh, because very few thousands are in, in circulation. Hundreds are all over the place now. So you got to kind of watch it when you get a $100 bill and make sure it still has, look for the, look for the, uh, the hologram on the image and that stripe and also look at hold it up to the light and make sure you see the image behind. And if you're really clever, go look for the microprints. They're all over the place too. And it's really hard for, for uh, 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 most people to make those microprints because uh, gravier printing, uh, and this is stuff, I'm giving you an example of how you should learn about everything as much as you can. The gravier printing used to print US money actually has text on the side of the, t of the printing. So if you, it prints with a thick layer of material and they put in some text that's only on the edges. So you can tilt the bill and look at it and you might see it. Uh, but that's never done in most places. Uh, there's a bunch of other stuff in it too, but uh, just thought I'd bring that up. The third round, uh, we decided we'd print some money and we also printed tortillas. We printed food grade material on food, uh, which was kind of fun. And it showed that there was lots of opportunity for this technology. We were just scratching the surface. And as you know now today, there is quite a bit. Oh, by the way, I, I failed to mention that in that third round, uh, we also demonstrated that you could print integrated circuits. You could print uh, circuitry. Uh, and uh, right now today, there are companies that are printing uh, their, uh, their displays. They use an inkjet to print the material to make those displays. So you can do things like that with it. Um, then in the fourth round, we started talking about page wide arrays of printing to make very, very high speed printers. How am I doing for time? I can't see my clock. Let's see, 10 minutes to the hour. Okay, we'll go a little bit farther. When should I stop, by the way? Somebody got a suggestion? We want to be complete. What? I didn't hear that. So we want to be completely done by 920. OK, OK. Well, I will spend a few more slides, and then I'm going to open it up for questions. So I'm going to probably get done at 9. Oh, five, but I could carry on more after that if we feel like it. Uh, now, here's some dots. I, I suggested that I'd show you some dots. Here's some dots from inkjet printing. And this is a very special media. It's not really paper. What it is, is it's basically silica gel, which is basically sand that absorbs stuff. And it's a very fine grain sand. And you'll notice that you see these drops and they look kind of like uh, eggs, don't they? they they're kind of this 
this shape. That's because it was a spherical, almost spherical drop and it landed, but we were moving the pen across the page so fast that the tail of the drop didn't land in the same place as the head did. Okay, but if you look at the image over here, you can't tell that the droplets aren't, aren't round. Uh, which brings up another interesting thing that was necessary to learn. And that is, how do people see things? Okay, well, they don't see these little teeny round dots because they're below the resolution limit of their eyes. Put a magnifying glass up or a microscope and I can see them. But the acuity of the human eye is about three tenths of a millimeter at half a meter. And that's a physiological fundamental thing. You know, your eye is composed of a bunch of little rods and cones, and the size of that rod determines the acuity you have for black and white printing. And by the way, your resolution for color is not the same as black and white, it's worse. So what we can do here, and this is uh, useful for engineers, is we can take that fact about human eyesight, and then we can use a bunch of dots of color in a larger region and make that appear to be a color to somebody. Okay, so uh, after getting out of school, I got the opportunity to learn all about color science, which is really interesting and fascinating. I recommend it to anybody. You learn about uh, additive colors and you learn about subtractive colors. You learn about the fact that you can use a projected image. You actually can make very nice vivid color systems using only two colors and you can make a wide spectrum of colors with that. Uh, that's because you can change the frequency that those things flash on the surface, and then you'll see different colors that aren't even there from the latent image that comes from your eye. Um, those kind of displays aren't in common use, and there's one really big reason that medical people will know. Um, if you have a flashing image that's at too low a frequency, it can cause some people to go into epileptic seizure. So you don't want to make too many displays of that nature uh, and hand them out. Uh, you might be suffering from causing people to go into convulsions. Not so good. Uh, but you can make those kind of displays. They're very curious. Uh, three color displays are far more frequent because you can keep the image longer and you don't have to rely upon that latent image process. So I'm kind of trying to give you the idea that uh, you're going to study a field when you go into your next education scheme, but don't constrain yourself by whatever field you happen to go into. Go study everything. Uh, uh, you know, not everything all the way down to, you know, dirt, uh, to, to everything about everything, but get a flavor for everything. And then another thing that's important is to have friends that you know that know things that you don't know, okay? It's okay to have other people help you. You don't have to have everything on the planet in your brain. In fact, if you do, you're, you're, you know, you're probably making a mistake because you'll come up with a very good and totally wrong solution to a problem. Okay. Well, the first th thermal ink jet that came out came out in 1984, and we had started it in 1981, and we called it St. Helens. And that's because we lived in Corvallis, Oregon, and in 1981, the mountain St. Helens in Washington blew up. It's a volcano and it spit out a really big inkjet. So we decided that's a good way to start off the naming of our project. Nobody would know what we're working on, which they didn't. You know, we could use, hey, I'm working on the St. Helens project when we're wandering around in a public setting and nobody would know that it's actually a secret project on thermal inkjet at Hewlett Packard. Okay, anyhow, that one. The first generation started off, we used a glass substrate. Uh, direct drive means all that's on there is a bunch of resistors. And this little thing that looks like a grand piano, that's a nozzle plate. It's been designed to allow, uh, sit right over the top of the, uh, the chambers, and it has 12 nozzles. Now, I don't know if you'll ever get to go see one of these. There's still actually some of these in use in some applications, like on some buses, they use them to print out receipts. Uh, fascinatingly enough, that technology has continued to this day, making it pretty darn old. Okay, 40 years is a long time for a technology. But uh, 
the interesting thing about this, this nozzle plate, if you ever do get to go see one, is I told you there's 12 nozzles. Well, there are 14 holes. OK, well, that's funny. Why are there 14 holes? OK, I will, I will answer this one because we are in the interest of time. It turns out that when we designed this system, it's a big giant fluid mechanics challenge to get droplets to come out of those nozzles and have them all come out the same size. OK, so one solution is to spend the rest of your life figuring out the resistor heating technique that you want where you heat up a certain amount and then cool it off and heat it up and cool it off so that you only get droplets out of each 12 nozzles that each of the 12 nozzles that are exactly the same. But we didn't have time left for that. So what we did instead was we designed a plate where all except the N2 nozzles work right. And if you ever go into mathematics and study periodic functions, you'll find that periodic functions are a whole lot easier to solve than singularity functions. And that's what we did. So all the nozzle plates except have 14 nozzles. The N2 nozzles are the singularity nozzles. You can't really make droplets come out right from them. But all the others behave all the same because they are part of a periodic structure. That's kind of a sneaky way to solve an incredibly difficult problem. OK. Um, by the way, uh, there are all kinds of strange inks that we came up for these things. Uh, there's fluorescent inks. There's phosphorescent inks. There's magnetic inks. In fact, there are some inks that uh, you can print a letter, and you will see a bunch of text on it that says something like, the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. But if you then read it with a magnetic reader, it will have a completely different message. There's the first printer we came up with. And believe it or not, at that time, all printers had knobs on them. And we had a meeting where we were showing off this new printer that was going to go out on the market back in 1984. And one of the managers insisted that it had to have a knob on it to be a printer. So we glued one on for him. Of course, it didn't do anything, but we put it on the side. And then uh, he was happy. And then we took it back off and started selling the product. OK. So this thing began in 1980. It was in a trailer outside a building. There wasn't a lot of money put into it. And it printed on a very special paper. And that's when it was introduced in 1984. And that's when uh, there was the opportunity to make an ink for plain paper printing. So how could we make an ink for plain paper printing? Uh, let me explain why it's not trivial to do that. First of all, these are what the ink must do. It's got to go out of these little tiny chambers. It's got to be able to boil and not leave a residue. Every other ink on the planet, those that aren't for inkjet and those that aren't for thermal inkjet, do not. It doesn't matter if it leaves a residue. In fact, if you look at any ink you can find, you're going to find that if you boil them, they're going to leave a bunch of crud someplace. Uh, we had a term for that, which we had uh, several of our members of our group were from different countries. So it became called koga, which I think is a Japanese word for burned biscuit, but I don't really know. But anyhow, it got to be called koga. And when a pen failed like that, it was failed due to cogation. That was our, one of our biggest challenges to fix that problem. We felt it needed to be non-toxic. A lot of inks that you see in ballpoint pens and other things they're, they're not non-toxic. You don't want to be sucking your ballpoint pen too much, uh, some of you. <laughs> but uh, we felt that it needed to be non-toxic for home use because we could just see some kid taking an inkjet pen and deciding that it's something to drink. And in fact, uh, during the research phase, that actually did happen. Um, we had sent out some inks to one of the research and development managers at another division that was working on the printers. And uh, she gave me a call in the middle of the night and said, what do I do? My three-year-old and his puppy just ate a pen. And I said, well, luckily the inks are non-toxic, so you don't have to worry too much. But I do strongly recommend that you put a lot of paper on the floor, newspaper, because the puppy 
is going to have diarrhea. Uh, and that's because the non-toxic ink had a lot of glycol in it. And diethylene glycol is a really good laxative. So that's the only downside of these inks where they, they did a good job of that. And uh, she thanked me for having the foresight to make it non-toxic. But she said, next time, please, please don't put so much glycol in them. OK. Uh, we needed to have excellent dot formation on the media. We wanted to have nice round dots to make good text and thing. If it wicked along the surface of the paper, that would make the print all smeared and people couldn't read it. Uh, we needed to be able to refill the chamber quickly. So we needed to have a high surface tension. It'd have a viscosity about like water. Uh, ballpoint pen ink has a viscosity about a thousand times that of water. And it needed to not dry and clog the open nozzles. These pens are open all the time. They got a 50 micron nozzle sitting there. So we had to do some clever stuff in chemistry to make that happen. And that's why the glycol was in it, by the way. Because if you know uh, a little bit about chemistry, you realize that ethylene glycol is used for antifreeze. A diethylene glycol is a non-toxic version of, of, a, of a glycol. Um, and it has the same feature, but it costs more. Anyhow, um, uh, and consequently, if you have a solution of water and glycol, and you have it in a little tiny capillary, all the water is going to evaporate, but the glycol doesn't. Uh, so that means it becomes what's called a soft plug. So we had the pen, as soon as you let it set for a while, the printer knew it was setting, it would then go over to a little area we call the spittoon, and it would spit out a couple of drops and it start printing. And that would get rid of this soft plug of ethylene glycol that, or diethylene glycol that would never really dry on the paper. And then we go back to printing with the regular stuff. Okay, well, there was a very strong want by everybody was that it would print on normal paper. Well, that didn't happen with that first product. The first product used very special paper. And then uh, research took place to make the plain paper ink. Okay, well, I've talked for quite a while here. I know because I'm hoarse and you're getting bored. So I'm going to more or less stop with this. And that is that, what did we know? We knew about electronics. We knew about stuff we needed to learn. We needed to learn all about paper, what it is. And that was fascinating because this is part of the fun part. Uh, I was forced to go on trips all over the world to learn about paper and also all over the world to get help on building inks. So here I am, uh, a fairly young guy and I've been told, okay, uh, tomorrow you're going to get, you know, where would you like to go to learn? Well, I got to learn about paper and it's springtime. So I think I need to study Swedish paper. So I went up there and swooped the spring and that was great. Then uh, in the wintertime, I had to study uh, the papers from Indonesia. Okay. Now, so you can plan where you're going to have to learn things. Kind of cool. Okay. So we need to learn about paper. We need to learn about ink, all the ink. Uh, uh, companies in the world we figure out who makes ink and we went to work and interviewed and worked with them for quite a bit of time so we're getting resources from other people to help us uh, they didn't know anything about inkjet they were really fascinated by it uh, and the, but they did know how to make inks and they taught us a lot about what we needed to have in inks and they taught us about things like the perception of color because they've been doing that okay i told you about how you got we got money we, we did demonstrations uh, in the company I was working in. Uh, we used to call those dog and pony shows. You bring your dog and pony and you show it off and then people like it. And if they do, you get more funding so you can have fun in the lab, okay? Which is what we liked, okay? There was internal strife within the company. Uh, some people said you can never make an ink for plain paper printing. Uh, it's just not gonna happen. Uh, well, you've got to have a little bit of faith in yourself that you can. And that's where um, I, for one, and a few others in the group decided we're going to do it and we'll stake our reputation on it. You know, you can fire us if we don't get it done. Um, and that's, and they, they said we need it by some date. You know, they picked a day, the arbitrary date, I don't know, three years from the time we said we could make it. And so we worked and worked and worked. And three years from that time, we didn't get done. It took three, six and a half, three quarters years. See that? And uh, turned out that the first product introduced without the plain paper ink. Uh, and it still was a pretty good success. 
And then we had three more years of work in the lab before we got what we thought was acceptable to get out to the market. And um, still, uh, that was advanced and beyond what everybody else was doing, so it worked just fine. And yep, there was a lot of people complaining about how long it was taking. But during that time, we came up with things to show them what our problems were and why it wasn't trivial. And with that kind of work, you know, things happen, especially if you work with groups that are, that are uh, rational and believe in physics, like I mentioned up above, and chemistry and science, and they trust their engineering and science staff. You got that, you're in good shape. And if you find that you're not getting that kind of trust, my recommendation for you is to find another company because it's not going to happen and there's no reason not to move. Okay, well, I think I've talked enough. You should 